listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is September 27, 2019, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Evaluation and Treatment of Sinusitis. Our presenter is Dr. Daniel Hamelos. He's the Director of the Allergy Clinical and Translational Research at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. Friday, September 27th, 2019. Uh, for our first um, talk this morning, we have the pleasure of having Dr. Daniel Hamelos um, with us. Dr. Hamelos is uh, Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Um, he's on staff at uh, Mass General Hospital um, in the Allergy Immunology Department um, at, um, in Boston. Um, Dr. Hamelos is well known in the allergy community as being an expert on sinusitis. And I've asked him once again to talk to us this morning about sinusitis and some of the new therapies that are on the horizon for treatment of sinusitis and polyposis. So I'll let Dr. Hamlos take it away. Thank you, Paul, and welcome, everybody. Um, so what I hope to do in the next 45 minutes or so is talk about how I view um, chronic rhinosinusitis, uh, including distinct clinical subsets and then how I approach each of those uh, in the, in the uh, clinical arena. And um, so these are the learning objectives. Uh, there are several types of chronic rhinosinusitis, um, and I'll go through those. Um, most of these are well recognized, but some of the terminology that I'm giving you is going to be fairly new. You may not have heard about it before. And we'll talk about treatment uh, as it pertains to the individual types of CRS. First things first, um, it's important to know that sinuses, um, children have sinuses when they're uh, newborns have sinuses, but the sinuses continue to develop uh, as children grow uh, until about age uh, 12 or so, sometimes even a little bit later. Uh, the last one to develop is the frontal sinus, and you can see in the picture in the lower right-hand corner how that, that development occurs as the skull gets bigger. Uh, the, the maxillary is the first to develop, and uh, so it's present even at birth. There are many anatomic abnormalities in the sinuses, and I, I really enjoy showing these to the fellows uh, on Friday mornings uh, earlier than we have this, this COLA lecture, but most of these pertain to the area we call the osteomedial unit. So the purpose of this slide is to show you the osteomedial unit and the uh, five structures that comprise the osteomedial unit. You should remember this is the most important uh, anatomic site in the sinuses, and the reason for that is because it is the common uh, drainage area for both the anterior ethmoids as well as the maxillary sinuses. And furthermore, um, when a surgeon does what we call functional endoscopic surgery, the attention is all placed on this osteomedial unit. So they want to remove, for example, the uncinate process, uh, because that's the first thing that they have to do to get, get the opening to the maxillary sinus to be bigger. And then they need to work on um, getting uh, removing ethmoid air cells so that the ethmoids are opened as well. This is also the area where most of the anatomic abnormalities occur. And they're, they're really called anatomic variants. And um, they are a curiosity. They are interesting. Uh, surgeons need to pay attention to them. We need to pay attention to them as well, but uh, they don't necessarily predict if you're going to have sinus problems. They really do not predict that. Uh, as I said, most of them pertain to the osteomedial unit, and they include these, uh, these things listed here, Haller cells, pneumatized uncinate process, conchabulosa, paradoxical curvature of the middle turbinate, and septum deviation. On the other hand, there's one anatomic variant that's outside of the osteomedial unit, this is in the uh, posterior ethmoid and sphenoid area, and that's called an onodi cell. And you should be aware of that one as well because that's an important um, anatomic variant that, that impacts on what's done surgically. So on this next slide, there are illustrations of these different things. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but just to show you, the one in the middle on the top in panel B is conchabulosa deformities. These are air-filled middle turbinates. Uh, they're often bilateral, but they're a lot of times they're uh, 
uh, asymmetric. So you see on the right hand side, I'm sorry, the left hand side here is much bigger. Uh, they oftentimes seem to shape the adjacent structures so that the septum uh, often is deviated, S sort of uh, looks like it's being pushed by the conchabulosa or the osteomedial unit will appear somewhat distorted as well. Um, it's a it's common anatomic abnormality. Uh, the conchabulosa can become infected, and just like an ethmoid cell, so you see that in the upper right. Um, another one is the um, infraorbital ethmoid cell, and that's in panel E. That's a halar cell, and so that's a common abnormality. You can see it's right by the uncinate process, and so that's why uh, it's considered to impact on the osteomedial unit. Uh, the other ones I'll just leave you to, to look at yourself. The agronazi in the upper left here is, an, is a supra, um, is, is the most anterior ethmoid cell, and it impacts on the osteomedial unit because it sits right above it. On the other hand, um, this is uh, an example of an onodi cell. There's actually bilateral onodi cells. And what's happening here is that the posterior ethmoid, as it develops, it extrudes itself superior to this phenoid sinus. So what you end up with is a horizontal septation, and it looks like it's a horizontal septation in this phenoid sinus. But in fact, that doesn't happen. So if you see a septation horizontally in the sphenoid, uh, then you, you immediately should think of it being an onodi cell. Now the reason this is important is if you look on the, the low panel, the lower panel here, this is a left-sided onodi cell and notice that it's right next to the optic nerve. If a surgeon thought that the onodi cell was actually part of the sphenoid, he, he or she would probably not be thinking um, that they were very close to the optic nerve, but on the other hand, in the case of the onodi cell, it's, it's right adjacent to it, so there have been instances where um, this cavity was entered surgically and there was uh, then the adjacent um, optic nerve was damaged and the patient became blind. So that's why it's important. Um, this is now the classification that we've had for chronic rhinosinusitis that, that goes back to 2004. Uh, I was privileged to be part of this group that made this classification scheme. And uh, it's still in existence today, so we still really talk about three main types of chronic rhinosinusitis, or what we term CRS, namely CRS without nasal polyps on the left here, CRS with nasal polyps on the right, and then this subcategory of CRS with polyps that we call eosinophilic mucin with fungal hyphae. This is what we call classic allergic fungal rhinosinusitis. And I know that in Kansas City you see cases of this because I'm from St. Louis area and uh, our climate there is virtually the same as yours and there are a lot of mold spores in the area and you will see cases of this. What it does, what this classification scheme did not uh, really appreciate was all these factors at the bottom that we now understand a lot more about and so we can really think more in terms of um, being much more precise about the classification. We've always known that uh, in practice, chronic rhinosinusitis is truly a spectrum. Uh, many patients have infection going on, but then there's also a very significant non-infectious uh, component, and that, the one that's best described is the T2 type or TH2 type component, uh, which in, involves uh, the TH2 cytokines and many eosinophils. But in practice, this again, this is a spectrum. Polyps are really on the right-hand side here, and uh, non-polypoid CRS without nasal polyps is on the left, but there are uh, many intermediate forms as well. Uh, this is how I view the current classification of chronic rhinosinusitis, and notice too that in, in the writing here, there are clinical subcategories that are, aren't even included on this. Um, but we can now describe many more subtypes, including, for example, under polyps, you would not only have allergic fungal, but we also have what we call eosinophilic mucin rhinosinusitis. And this is a special category, and I'm sure you see this as well, because it's more common actually than allergic fungal. These people on their CT scans have a lot of um, sinus opacification. They have nasal polyps, but they, they have what are called hyperdensities on their sinus CT scan, which raises a question about uh, fungal colonization in the mucus namely allergic fungal rhinosinusitis. Uh, 
but in fact they don't have fungi when when you go in and surgically remove the mucus it's just very very dense eosinophilic mucin so I distinguish these two things because this is truly not allergic fungal uh, the EMRS patients do have a very intense T TH2 inflammation but they respond well to treatments targeting that uh, we had patients in the dupilumab study last year and one of them has uh, EMRS and his sinus disease in the CT regressed a lot uh, on dupilumab and that's without any kind of antifungal treatment so that to keep that in mind the other subtypes uh, innate immune defects this is a, a very interesting area because much of the uh, infectious problems that people with sinus disease get has to do with innate immune defects we know very little about them but but we're starting to uh, unravel that mystery then we also have patients who have hypogamma globulinemia and most of those are uh, non polypoid CRS we have patients with cystic fibrosis and 40 percent of them have polyps so that sort of an you know uh, crosses the boundaries between CRS without and CRS with polyps and primary ciliary dyskinesia similarly um, been described either with or without polyps I would note that the polyps that you see in, in CF and uh, primary ciliary dyskinesia are not the classic uh, TH2 dominant uh, polyps, however. Um, I'm going to skip over this. This is just, um, I did this a few years ago. This was just sort of like some of the factors uh, associated with the inflammation that you see in patients with uh, CRS. And the bottom line is that if you don't have polyps, you're more likely to have things like facial pain and recurring infections whereas or, or hypogamma globulinemia whereas if you have polyps you're much more likely to have things like anosmia agusia which are uh, loss of smell and taste you're more much more likely to have allergic fungal in fact virtually all cases of allergic fungal have polyps um, you're more likely to use steroids and you're more likely to have asthma so th those things are important and uh, keep that in mind now we're talking about the matrix being really many more factors uh, based on what we call endotypes and this this slide just basically is a cartoon about that but but the cytokines that are present in the tissue are what define the endotypes and I will show you a little bit of information about endotypes because there are a few papers on that now now I'm going to just go through some of the classic presentations this is CRS without nasal polyposis um, designated CRS SNP or CRS without nasal polyps. These people have sinus osteal occlusion in one or more sinuses. Any of the sinuses can be affected and uh, multiple ones can be affected in individual patient. This particular x-ray that you see here, uh, there's obstruction of the osteomedial complex area so the maxillary sinuses are nearly completely opacified. You can kind of imagine that the left maxillary here is full of thick mucus, but uh, radiologists usually don't call it an air fluid level unless it's nice and straight. If you do surgery, you're going to see inflamed tissue, probably with some uh, purulent drainage, uh, a lot of erythema and unhealthy looking mucosa. You don't see polyps. If you look at it under the microscope, you're going to see chronic inflammation. Um, it's sort of a mixed mononuclear and neutrophilic inflammation. There's also glandular hyperplasia, which is important because ultimately their tissue never goes back to normal. Um, most of these people have some microscopic evidence of infection. And the underlying problem in these cases is more likely to be an innate immune defect or a mucociliary clearance than it is any kind of a systemic uh, immune problem. The predisposing factors for this are where the innate immune system is really starting to be unraveled. And what we know most uh, definitively is that, for example, a defect in a bitter taste receptor, which is a receptor that's expressed on the epithelium of the sinuses and the nose, um, can a defect here uh, will result in a lack in nitric oxide production and that it, in and of itself is a problem because High concentrations of nitric oxide are normally made in the sinuses enough so that they have antimicrobial effects. And that's against a wide range of bacteria, including Pseudomonas, Staph aureus, and other bacteria. We also know that if you have defect in innate immunity, you're more likely 
or of defective mucociliary clearance as well, you're more likely to have a biofilm problem, which is uh, bacteria that are adherent to the mucosa, and they persist there despite antibiotic treatment. They are uh, inherently more resistant to antibiotic treatment, and so sinus problems can often come back after surgery in, in patients who have that kind of problem. There's some other defects that have been reported, such as defect in lactoferrin and defect in the, a plunk protein, which has antimicrobial effects as well. So I view this as the, the key, really, to most cases of CRS without basal polyps. I don't view them as having primarily an anatomic problem. I view them as having a problem in innate immunity. Um, remember that nitric oxide is really highly produced in the sinuses it, in 9.1 parts per million. In the lungs, for example, we, we measure nitric oxide in parts per billion. So it, in the lungs, it's a thousandfold less than in the sinuses. And in the lungs, it's considered pathologic to have high levels of nitric oxide, whereas in the sinuses, it's pathologic if you don't have high concentrations of nitric oxide. Okay, let's uh, move on. My job in CRS without nasal polyps, really, I, I, my bias is that I like to eradicate infection because I, and I want to restore the sinus osteopatency. If I don't do those things, the patient is not going to get better and they'll ultimately need surgery. There's a lot of debate about the, the best way to, to do these things. And in fact, if you read guide, expert guidance reports, they, they really kind of poo-poo the idea of this being an infection. Uh, I think it's truly a disservice, but I, I realize I'm kind of a, a lone wolf standing on a platform uh, saying that because uh, a lot of people just don't like to uh, advocate use of antibiotics, especially not for long periods of time, uh, out of concern for drug resistance and things like that. But uh, I usually hit these patients with antibiotics when I first see them. I usually combine it with a short course of prednisone, and oftentimes uh, I can do that, and I can clear infection and restore the sinus osteo and keep the patients from needing surgery. But if that doesn't work, uh, of course, I'm also giving them saline rinses and intranasal steroids like Flonase or something like that. If those things don't work, of course, I'm going to refer them to an ENT colleague, and they're going to need surgery. Um, one thing that I do, I do nasal endoscopy on patients, and this is an example here at the bottom uh, on, the, on the lower left. You see the middle turbinate. This is on the left-hand side. The septum is, is here, the middle turbinate, and then this is the middle meatus. Now, uh, I'll warn you that the middle meatus usually doesn't open up quite like this. So you, you don't really see the ostium uh, of the maxillary sinus or the ethmoids. You, you just sort of see a narrow slit here. But a lot of times you'll see pus coming down this way, and, and you can just slip a either a suction catheter like this or even just a, a cotton tip swab, which is how, we, how you typically do it. You can slip it into the middle meatus, and you can get a, uh, a directed culture, and that helps really determine the type of bacteria that you're dealing with and then treat that appropriately. This, uh, this one here, this uh, lower middle panel, is uh, a patient who's had prior surgery. You can see there's a big opening to the maxillary sinus. Uh, this is another instance where um, it's very accessible to a swab, and I can and put a swab in like is shown here on the right, and I can find out, you know, and who knows what's in there. There could be Pseudomonas, Staph aureus, MRSA. A variety of things can be there, and if you don't, really do this and you end up treating people empirically with antibiotics, oftentimes that fails and, and people end up going to surgery because you didn't really eradicate the infection. Now let's switch gears. This is the under, uh, other end of the spectrum. This is CRS with nasal polyps. And so now we're really talking about an inflammatory, eosinophilic inflammatory disease, Th2 predominant inflammation, uh, studies that uh, I and my group did uh, back in the early 90s mapped out, you know, the, by in-situ hybridization that there's increased production of Th2 cytokines like IL-5 and IL-13 in polyps. Uh, there's very large numbers of eosinophils that is the dominant uh, cell that you see. 
And um, you know that those findings that we we had reported or been corroborated many times, and now this has sort of laid the foundation for treating nasal polyps with biologic drugs that target Th2 inflammation, and that includes IL-5, but also uh, IL-4 plus IL-13, namely dupilumab, which is the only one that's approved yet for treatment, but there are studies uh, ongoing with uh, Facenra, which is the IL-5 receptor blocking drug also, as well as uh, anti-IgE uh, omalizumab is being studied. So this is a diffuse bilateral disease. You can see this patient in the, in the uh, x-ray here has had prior surgery, but yet the disease is still very active. Uh, it's polypoid. You can see how it has this uh, cobblestone-like appearance. Uh, it involves all the sinuses in this case. This particular patient doesn't have uh, frontal sinuses, so you don't see it up there. But if, if the frontals were there, you would see it in the frontals as well. What we know about the driving uh, forces for eosinophilic disease in uh, polyps is that it's not usually due to systemic allergy, but it's more due to local factors, and uh, some of those are local factors that promote IgE production, and that is classically described for Staph aureus through Staph aureus superantigens, which uh, uh, you, you have a, a, a skewing of a response to superantigens in a Th2-type manner, and that results in local production of IL-4, IL-13, and then um, stimulating B cells to produce uh, staph superantigen specific IgE. So this is one way this process is being driven. Uh, these patients are very typically colonized with staph aureus. Another way is that there can be uh, polar polarization uh, to other allergens such as dust mites or fungal allergens, and, and some of the patients do have dust mite or fungal allergy, but that's only about half of the cases, so uh, we can't really invoke this as a, a sort of a classic allergic disease in many of those cases. So we're sort of left wondering, like, could there be other reasons for the uh, driving uh, an eosinophilic disease? And the answer to that is yes, uh, because the epithelium itself makes factors that promote Th2 inflammation, and the ones that are really touted so far would be TSLP, thymic stromal uh, lymphopoietin, and IL-33. These are known to um, be produced in the epithelium, and there is a, a skewing toward production of these in polyps. And the result of this is to drive a, a non-allergic mechanism, basically, for getting eosinophils into the tissue. And uh, I think what you're going to see in the next few years is there's going to be trials, clinical trials of TSLP monoclonal blocking monoclonal antibodies as well as IL-33 blocking monoclonal antibodies uh, for treatment of polyps as well as uh, what we call intrinsic asthma, which is non-allergic asthma. Now, the mainstays for treating polyps, uh, of course, you can surgically remove polyps, uh, but in, in the majority of cases, they're going to come back because these local factors are going to still be present. So we usually treat them with systemic steroids uh, initially to shrink polyps and improve symptoms. And then it's important to use topical steroids with adequate potency and adequate delivery to uh, keep the disease from recurring. Um, I want to mention, emphasize that uh, polyposis can be one of these different varieties, uh, either allergic fungal, eosinophilic mucin rhinosinusitis, or even this very small subset that we call aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, um, those are important to recognize because they are treated somewhat differently. And then finally, this process is amenable to uh, T2 T inflammation targeted monoclonal antibodies. My job in these patients, uh, when I see them, I'm not going to be the surgeon. So my first job is I try to stabilize the disease with systemic steroids. I devise a strategy for use of topical steroids, and you'll see that I oftentimes use topical budesonide, which is not approved necessarily for this, for, this, for this disease, but works very well. I address any allergic comorbidities. I address asthma. I consider whether these other subtypes of uh, polyps are present. And in the worst cases, I consider biologic treatment. And when I can't do anything uh, to, to, to um, satisfactorily manage it, then I get my ENT colleagues involved. 
Now, allergic fungal is a subset of polyps, as I mentioned. Um, it's, just, it's said that all AFRS patients have polyps. I had one patient who met criteria for AFRS who didn't have polyps. So I, I'm a little open-minded about this, but, but suffice it to say, this is considered a disease with polyps. It is an intense Th2 type inflammation directed at colonizing fungi. This is, is important that you recognize that AFRS is a non-invasive fungal disease. It is not in any way invasive. And if you have any questions about that, if you, especially if you have an immune compromised patient, somebody on uh, immunosuppressive medicines or a transplant patient or something like that, uh, and you, you were thinking that you have polyps and you, you may have fungal involvement, you really have to make sure it's not an invasive problem in those cases. The diagnosis to this um, is, first of all, the presence of polyps, uh, occluded sinuses with um, very dense, thick mucus, as well as polyps. And when the mucus is taken out, it shows eosinophilic inflammation that we call allergic mucin, and it also contains fungal hyphae. These people are also allergic to the fungus, so when you do skin testing or uh, in vitro immunocap testing, they're going to be allergic to fungi as well. So I just went through the main criteria, and you have them again shown here. This is a, a disease, I sort of mentioned this before, but it's highly geographically uh, distinct. So areas where there's a lot of uh, ambient spores in the air, fungal spores, uh, is where this is the most common disease. And you see it a lot in Texas, Louisiana, Georgia, uh, the Midwest, Kansas City, St. Louis, whereas up in um, Seattle area, we don't see very many cases. And in Denver, you almost never see this. It's too dry out there. Uh, you virtually never see it out there. We see it in Boston because we have quite a bit of humidity here as well. Uh, so these are the criteria. For the disease, I won't uh, belabor that. I want to show you a picture of a classic case. This is a patient of mine. The, the CT shows a couple of the classic findings. First of all, the, the, um, you look at the nose first. The nose is completely filled, and po there's polyps here. Of course, you can't say they're polyps, but they were polyps filling the nose. Second of all, the sinuses are completely occluded, and that is polypoid tissue as well as um, what we call hyperdensities. The hyperdensities, you can easily see them here uh, because you see that the opacification of the sinuses is, is very uh, inhomogeneous. And what this is really translates to is dense eosinophilic mucin. Um, and this is also seen in allergic, I'm sorry, in um, eosinophilic mucin rhinosinusitis, and that's a point that I want to emphasize that the presence of these hyperdensities is something that the CT radiologist will alert you to and say, think about allergic fungal, but it turns out that a lot of cases they aren't allergic fungal, they're EMRS rather than AFRS. Another feature though that's classic for, for AFRS here is that this, uh, this sinus, this uh, ethmoid area, just uh, the inflammation is so intense that it eroded through bone, and so you see bony erosion. Uh, this, in, in general, in AFRS, this occurs in 20% of cases, and uh, it's much more likely to be uh, an AFRS case rather than EMRS, if that is true. Remember that to, you, to cleanse the diagnosis, you have to look at the mucus. It has to be eosinophilic mucin. You have to see fungal hyphae in the mucus, and you also, it's, you need to look at the tissue, stain the tissue also for a fungus, and make sure there's no invasive fungal disease. These are just other examples. Uh, all the sinuses can be involved. Here you can see the sphenoids are involved, and it looks like there's bony erosion even through the sphenoid in these cases. The frontal sinus can also erode uh, into the brain, so this is a, it's a, an amazingly intense inflammation that occurs. One of the uh, notes about, about the um, hyperdensities and uh, what we call allergic fungal is that uh, on CT scan you see a, uh, the hyperdensities and you see a very opacified sinus. But if you look at it on MRI scan, it looks invisible on T2 weighted images. So that could be a board question. Keep that in mind. Um, oftentimes, in a, especially in a case where there was bony erosion, the uh, radiologist may recommend doing a CT uh, 
to help rule out tumors and things like that. And lo and behold, when you look on the CT, uh, you don't see any tumor, which is good, but you also don't see anything in the sinuses, and it looks really strange because that sinus looks normal. But that's, that's just a uh, peculiarity about the dense uh, eosinophilic mucin, and it's invisible on T2-weighted images. So um, really the conundrum here is to say, okay, I've got a case that could be allergic fungal, or it could be eosinophilic mucin rhinosinusitis. Now, there's a few things that may sort of tip you one way or the other. Uh, the allergic fungal patients could be unilateral rather than bilateral. They're more likely to have bony erosion. They're more likely to be younger. They're more likely to be African-American. Uh, we don't know if that's a, a socioeconomic thing or whether this has to do with, uh, you know, differences in the inflammatory response that you see in African-Americans. I, I sort of think that it may be both. Uh, in there's certain endemic areas, allergic fungals, more common. On the other hand, in EMRS, the patients are always, virtually always bilateral. Uh, they're more likely to have asthma. They're more likely to be aspirin intolerant as well. So what distinguishes these two things, uh, this, is, this is a question for you, and the, the thing that distinguishes AFRS from EMRS the most is going to be the presence of fungal hyphae in the mucin, which you only see in AFRS. These other things you can see in, in both cases. So this is what I've been alluding to. This is eosinophilic mucin, rhinosinusitis. Uh, a friend of mine, Beryllin Ferguson, who passed away a couple of years ago, sadly, at a, a very young age, uh, she described this in 2000, and we see this all the time, uh, although not everybody uses this terminology, but I, I think it's really an important terminology to keep in mind uh, because these people most always have asthma. A third of them are, uh, have AERD. Many of them are the most steroid-resistant people that we have. So, uh, you know, I mentioned budesonide as an important treatment for polyps. Oftentimes when you put these patients on budesonide, they get some response, but they still have very large polyps, even despite that, or even despite using Nasonex. And sometimes they, they're on oral prednisone uh, bursts a lot just because their disease just keeps coming back. But they're very amenable to treatment with the targeted biologics like Dupixent. This is an example. Uh, this person's had surgery, but yet, and I know the images are a little, little fuzzy, but there's just polyps everywhere. This is a sphenoethmoidal recess on both sides, right and left, and, and this is inside the maxillary sinus. You can see this, why I call it cobblestone appearance, because this polypoid tissue looks like cobblestones. Um, I'm from the Midwest myself, and I used to, to see, have streets that are made out of cobblestone, so I'm very familiar with that. Uh, you see an overlying mucus that's, that's sort of like thick, uh, gluey mucus. Sometimes it gets greenish and glue-like. It doesn't look like pus. It looks like sort of like translucent uh, glue, uh, and that's, that's eosinophilic mucin. So we've already belabored that point, uh, just that EMRS is an important. It's, it's actually very common. And it's not AFRS, so we've, we don't find fungal hyphae. And the treatment's really going to be targeting the, the TS2 inflammatory response. Uh, and if they're aspirin sensitive, we would consider aspirin desensitization. Uh, and we consider biologic treatment uh, either with something that targets asthma, IL-5, or the depixent, which is now approved for polyps. Okay, um, there's a few other interesting uh, types of CRS that I'll mention, and then we'll stop for questions. The cystic fibrosis is a fascinating disease in many, many respects, but in terms of the sinuses, and, and I did write a review of this in JACI in practice. It's, it's published a couple of years ago. These are the, the things about cystic fibrosis CRS that are distinct. Everything on this slide is a distinct feature. So these people all have, of course, they have a genetic uh, mutation in the CFTR genes. And what, what happens there, of course, is that your chloride channels don't work properly. And so the mucus that's produced in the sinuses is, is thicker than normal. It doesn't have all the, the proper constituents either. And in fact, uh, the, the mutation in the CFTR results in an abnormal uh, acidity 
of the, the mucus, and as a result of that, some of the antimicrobial peptides uh, in the sinuses don't work right, uh, so you also have that as another factor. So they, they are infected because of this uh, mucociliary problem. They have unique bacteriology with uh, Staph aureus, Pseudomonas, other uh, weird pathogens like Burkhodaria and Alkalogenes. They have persistent infection with biofilm, and a lot of times that's very easy to see. You just see this mucus that's adherent everywhere. They have really interesting radiologic abnormalities. Their sinuses don't develop properly, uh, so the sinuses are smaller than normal. Uh, sometimes the uh, maxillary sinuses look very small because they've been infected for so long. They just sort of like look like they just don't develop. Um, they're very difficult to manage. Um, and they have polyps, as I mentioned, especially at early age. So children less than age six with polyps, you, you really need to think about CF. And then finally, medical management. We really don't have any approved medical managements for uh, cystic fibrosis, CRS. Uh, these patients uh, go to surgery, especially if they're going to have a lung transplant because the sinuses are a nidus for infection with uh, with pseudomonas and getting rid of that pseudomonas is important to try to help a transplanted lung stay uninfected. But even surgery, of course, is not great for these people and they need a lot of postoperative management. Um, just to reiterate all the treatment options that we have, and I, I haven't really mentioned some of these, but uh, everyone with CRS should be get saline irrigations and topical nasal steroids. That's recommended for all subcategories. Um, when I say topical nasal steroids, of course, when you use a uh, budesonide sinus rinse, namely like putting a, a 0.5 milligram budesonide in a teaspoon of saline and having people put their head upside down and lay on the side to try to apply the concentrated budesonide to their sinuses, that is a form of topical intranasal steroid. It just isn't one that's currently approved. Um, but there are several that are approved, including Nasonex, um, the device called an Xhance device, which you probably know of as an OptiNose, uh, which is a device that shoots fluticasone higher up in the sinuses. It is approved for polyps. And we even have uh, uh, stents that are drug-eluting momedazone, they can be applied either at the time of surgery or even in the office to try to help uh, deliver topical momedazone over a 90-day period. And, and that has been shown to be an effective way to shrink polyps as well. The problem is, of course, that eventually the drug elutes and then the problem will likely come back. I mentioned that antibiotics, there's a lot of controversy about this. Most uh, guidelines don't really... Uh, emphasize use of antibiotics unless there is evidence of infection, but uh, as I say, I'm, I'm more aggressive at looking for infection, especially in CRS without polyps. We've talked about the glucocorticoids a lot. Uh, I mentioned that aspirin desensitization is useful for AERD, and the thing to remember here is that uh, typically if somebody has a lot of polyps, we'll send them to surgery first, have them their polyps removed, and then we'll do the aspirin desensitization as soon as we can after surgery to, kind of, to try to keep the polyps from coming back. Uh, most experts do not recommend uh, desensitizing somebody who's got a nose full of polyps. And just, just for practical reasons, if, they, if it doesn't work, they'll end up with surgery and you'll have to stop the aspirin anyway. Antifungal drugs are really not recommended, uh, even in for allergic fungal. Uh, I have some ex limited experience with that, that, that they actually are helpful, but... It's really an adjunctive role. They don't replace the topical steroids. And then the biologics I've already mentioned. Um, I mentioned the Xhance device, uh, and this just shows you on the left here a typical like a Flonase or Nasonex spray going in the nose, whereas the Xhance uh, delivery of the fluticasone is going to shoot it up much higher in the nasal passages to try to get close to the sinus ostea. I mentioned the uh, budesonide rinses. Uh, here's how the formula for how I do it. It's not FDA approved. Uh, our patients are very good contortionists to put this in their nose and go in the head down position and then lay on the side. And this, these pictures at the bottom show a, a real life example of how effective this can be uh, for someone who has very extensive polyps uh, over even just a short period of time. Sometimes this works very well.
aspirin and desensitization, you all know about that. And then uh, finally, the biologic, targeted biologics. Where we are right now is that we have Dupixent that's approved, uh, but we also have uh, the uh, Benralizumab in clinical trial. We have Omalizumab in clinical trial, and we'll likely have others uh, targeting TSLP and IL-33 in the near future. So with that, I want to stop so uh, I can answer questions. Um, there's one thing. I mentioned the, the endotyping. This, this is a slide that summarizes an endotyping study done uh, by this group, Thomason, um, Klaus Bockert's group. It's a few years old, but this was like the first uh, endotyping paper. And basically what they did was they just looked at polyps. I'm sorry, they looked at uh, sinus tissue from all types of patients, including polyp patients and those who didn't have polyps. And they looked at their cytokines in the tissues, and then they sorted it out uh, based on the cytokines. And what they found was that cytokines in ES ES that associated with eosinophilia, namely IL-5, was mostly seen in polyp patients. And these are the clusters they call like 7, 8, 9, and 10. Whereas um, at the other end of the spectrum, they had patients who didn't have much in inflammation or they had neutrophil-type uh, inflammation. That was mostly a TH17 profile. And then finally, you have some people that are sort of in the intermediate category. And if you hearken back to that slide I showed you about a spectrum, this is exactly what I, I said in 2000, that there's a spectrum. And so you do see these people that have this sort of overlapping phenotype. The reason this is important is because as we start having more and more biologics available to treat people, we'll be able to sort of look at the, the tissue and we say, okay, this is a eosinophil-driven disease, so we should use an eosinophil-targeting biologic as opposed to, okay, this is a neutrophil-dominated inflammation, maybe we need to target TH17. So I think we're going to see more and more of that in the future.